right around the corner pretty much from where we live last week um 18 year old was murdered you know in front of a park and school violence is so prevalent in the city I like a suburban lifestyle maybe better where you know maybe we just have to worry about Catherine getting hit by a volleyball instead of getting shot Good morning, Blakedell. Today is Tuesday, June 6th. We know that once a child, teenager, has sustained a firearm injury, they have lifelong consequences. Non-fatal injuries are a really important public health concern there are somewhere between two to four times as many gun injuries that are not fatal compared to those that are fatal. We know firearms are the leading cause of death for children and teens in the United States between the ages of one to 19. That represents about 4,700 deaths every year, but that really represents the tip of the iceberg for these types of injuries. We estimate that somewhere between 170 and 175,000 Firearm injuries are occurring among all ages in this country, probably about 25,000 among children and teens. In our old neighborhood, we did have a lot of safety concerns. I grew up in the projects, so it was always a concern on a day-to-day. -day. Little by little, we've like moved further north in the Bronx. Growing up in New York City, you are desensitized a bit to violence because of the oversaturation of violence. But to the level we're seeing it now, it's, it's a normal thing. Like, it's just like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. There has been an unprecedented increase in gun violence from just before the pandemic to just after. We looked at New York City, Chicago, LA, and Philadelphia, looking at both fatal and non-fatal shootings and we saw that shootings affecting children, they nearly doubled across those cities, and that the impacts were disproportionately experienced by children of color. Initially, when we moved to the area about almost three years ago, we didn't have that many safety concerns, but being there as long as we have now, um, there are a lot of red flags that make us feel uncomfortable in the area. So we know that gun violence does tend to cluster, not just in certain neighborhoods, but even spaces within neighborhoods. So it could be that moving from uh, a place with a high incidence of gun violence to a different neighborhood or even a different place within a neighborhood might make a child safer, but there are many more factors that can complicate that, including the ability to afford living in another neighborhood the types of social connections that people maintain. It felt like a normal day. Got Catherine ready, dropped off her two older sisters to school, and then I had stopped by one of the offices that I was consulting. And since my parents didn't live far from that office, I actually stopped by my parents' house with her. We hung out there for a little bit until Gregory got out of work. I have a thyroid disorder, so he, he was like, we can stop by the pharmacy, we'll pick up the medication before we go home. Um, and the pharmacy was in the neighborhood that we previously lived in. You know, I parked on Valentine Avenue in the Bronx, and I just went inside the pharmacy and, you know, proceeded. Gunshots rang out. You know, I looked at Catherine and I saw that she was kind of like gasping but also trying to cry at the same time. And she had a baby pink coat on, and that's when I noticed that it was like tinged red. When I was walking back to the car, I see my wife holding Catherine, and then she just tells me, call 911, Catherine's been shot. That was the beginning of the surreal experience of knowing that an 11-month-old child, your child, was shot. She had a lobectomy of the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes on the left side of 
the brain. The skull on the left side of her head was impacted and shattered. She has a titanium implant. She also experienced a stroke, which resulted in a right-sided hemiparesis, which is a weakening of the muscles. We were initially told that she may not be able to walk again. Her speech may not be the same. We were there up until May 13th. We had doctors and specialists on site practically almost 24 hours a day. And then the therapies she's receiving, she was receiving them inpatient, she's still receiving them outpatient. I'm hungry. You're hungry? Gina's gonna come give you some breakfast. Yeah, what do you wanna eat today? When a child goes through a trauma like she did, what could happen is they could become aversive to food. So they're trying to control different things in their life that they lost control over. So for them, it's easy to control what goes in their mouth. So right now, what we're working on is her aversion to food. Hospital-based violence interventions are a really important piece of the response to gun violence because many people who get shot survive, but they have social needs, physical and mental health needs, but there's no guarantee that, depending on where you live, that you necessarily will have access to a fully-fledged hospital-based violence intervention program. We know that over 50% of those children and teens that are discharged from the hospital after sustaining a firearm injury require lifetime health care, disability care, support for their medical needs, social needs, and, and that's you know not only very intensive and requires a lot of medical effort, but it's also very expensive. Gratefully, we did have a GoFundMe at the time, thanks to a relative, and that's literally what helped pay our bills and helped make sure that we were fed while we went on this journey with Catherine. If the city is unable to essentially crack down and eliminate the epidemic of gun violence, the least they should be doing is compensating families for the aftermath. It is lifelong. We suffer lifelong. We are seeing an increase in non-fatal firearm injuries. Exactly what that margin is is somewhat difficult to determine because of the quality of the data. You know, where we're at currently with specifically non-fatal firearm injuries is that the CDC does a sampling of hospitals around the country and then takes that data, aggregates it, and then produces estimates for what that means nationally. However, the specific numbers are, are still something that we need better data on. And the example I often use is thinking about COVID. If in March of 2020, we weren't able to understand how many people were being infected with COVID in the United States, we wouldn't understand where to put our public health resources. The same thing is true with firearm injuries. I, I know that the government has the capabilities to do that. It's just a matter of, you know, pulling the money where it really needs to go if you really want to serve the people. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.